This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 2 Fifty Shades of Breakage Nothing's right anymore, say the poor losers. Yes, the world's in a bad state, says the conventional wisdom. We say, rather, that the world is fragmenting. We were promised a new world order, but it's the opposite that's occurring. A planetary generalization of liberal democracy was announced, but what is generalizing instead are the electoral insurrections against it and its hypocrisy, as the liberals bitterly complain. Zone after zone, the fragmentation of the world continues, unceremoniously and without interruption. And this is not just an affair of geopolitics. It's in every domain that the world is fragmenting. It's in every domain that unity has become problematic. Nowadays, there is no more unity in society than there is in science. The wage work system is breaking up into niches, exceptions, dispensatory conditions. The idea of a precariat conveniently hides the fact that there is simply no longer a shared experience of work, even precarious work, with the consequence that there can no longer be a shared experience of its stoppage either, and the old myth of the general strike must be put on the shelf of useless accessories. In like manner, Western medicine has been reduced to tinkering with techniques that break its doctrinal unity into pieces, such as acupuncture, hypnosis, or magnetism. Politically, beyond the usual parliamentary messing around, there's no more majority for anything. During the conflict in the spring of 2016, precipitated by the Loi Trevé, the most astute journalistic commentary noted that two minorities, a governmental minority and a minority of demonstrators, were clashing in front of a population of spectators. Our very ego self appears as a more and more complex, less and less coherent puzzle, so that to make it hold together, in addition to pills and therapy sessions, algorithms are necessary now. It's pure irony that the word wall is used to describe the solid stream of images, information, and commentary by which Facebook attempts to give a shape to the self. The contemporary experience of life in a world composed of circulation, telecommunications, networks, and a welter of real-time information and images trying to capture our attention is fundamentally discontinuous. On a completely different scale, the particular interests of the elite are becoming more and more difficult to posit as the general interest. One only has to see how hard it is for states to implement their infrastructure projects, from the Sousa Valley to Standing Rock, to realize that things aren't working anymore. The fact that now they have to be ready to bring the army and its special units into the national territory to protect building sites of any importance shows rather clearly that these projects are seen for the mafia-type operations that they are. The unity of the Republic, that of science, that of the personality, that of the national territory, or that of culture, have never been anything but fictions. But they were effective. What is certain is that the illusion of unity can no longer do its work of fooling people, of bringing them into line, of disciplining them. In every domain, hegemony is dead, and the singularities are becoming wild. They bear their own meaning in themselves, no longer expecting it from a general order. The petty supervisory voice that allowed anyone with a bit of authority to ventriloquate for others, to judge, classify, hierarchize, moralize, to tell everyone what they need to do and how they need to be, has become inaudible. All the need-tos are lying on the ground. The militant who knows what must be done. The professor who knows what you need to think. The politician who will tell you what is needed for the country. Speak in the desert. As things stand, nothing can match the singular experience where it exists. One rediscovers that opening oneself to the world doesn't mean opening oneself to the four corners of the planet, that the world is there where we are, 
Opening ourselves to the world is opening ourselves to its presence here and now. Each fragment carries its own possibility of perfection. If the world is to be saved, this will be in each of its fragments. As for the totality, it can only be managed. The epoch takes amazing shortcuts. Real democracy is buried where it was born 2,500 years before with the way in which Alexis Cyprus, scarcely elected, got no rest until he had negotiated its capitulation. One can read on its tombstone, ironically speaking, these words of the German Minister of Finance, Wolfgang Schable. We can't let elections change anything whatsoever. But the most striking thing is that the geopolitical epicenter of the world's fragmentation is precisely the place where its unification began under the name civilization 5,000 years ago. Mesopotamia. If a certain geopolitical chaos seems to be taking hold of the world, it's in Iraq and Syria that this is most dramatically demonstrated, that is, in the exact location where civilization's general setting and order began. Writing, accounting, history, royal justice, parliament, integrated farming, science, measurement, political religion, palace intrigues and pastoral power. This whole way of claiming to govern for the good of the subjects, for the sake of the flock and its well-being, everything that can be lumped into what we still call civilization was already, 3,000 years before Jesus Christ, the distinguishing mark of the kingdoms of Akkad and Sumer. Of course, there will be attempts at cobbling together a new denominational Iraqi state. Of course, the international interests will end up mounting harebrained operations aimed at state-building in Syria. But in Syria, as in Iraq, state-directed humanity is dead. The intensity of the conflicts has risen too high for an honest reconciliation to still be possible. The counter-insurrectionary war that the regime of Bashar al-Assad has conducted against his population with the support that we are aware of, has reached such extremes that no negotiations will ever again lead to anything like a new Syrian state worthy of the name. And no attempt at people-shaping, the bloody putting into practice of Brecht's ironic poem after the workers' uprising of 1953 against the new Soviet regime in East Germany. The people, through its own fault, has lost the confidence of the government and only by redoubling its efforts can it win it back. Would it not be easier, then, for the government to dissolve the people and elect a new one? Will have any positive effect? The ghosts of the dead won't let themselves be subdued by barrels of TNT. No one who's given some thought to what the European states were like in the time of their splendor can look at what still goes by the name of a state these days and see anything other than failures. Compared to the transnational powers, the states can no longer maintain themselves except in the form of holograms. The Greek state is no longer anything more than a conveyor of instructions it has no say in. The British state is reduced to walking the tightrope with Brexit. The Mexican state no longer controls anything. The Italian, Spanish, or Brazilian states no longer appear to have any activity beyond surviving the continuous avalanches of scandal whether on the pretext of reform or by fits of modernization, the present-day capitalist states are engaging in an exercise of methodical self-dismantling, not to mention the separatist temptations that are multiplying across Europe. It's not hard to discern, behind the attempts at authoritarian restoration in so many of the world's countries, a form of civil war that will no longer end whether in the name of the war against terrorism, drugs, or poverty, the states are coming apart at the seams. The facades remain, but they only serve to mask a pile of rubble. The global disorder now exceeds any capacity to restore order. As an ancient Chinese sage put it, when order reigns in the world, a fool can disturb it by himself alone. When chaos takes hold of it, a wise man cannot bring back the order by himself alone. 
We are the contemporaries of a prodigious reversal of the process of civilization into a process of fragmentation. The more civilization aspires to a universal completion, the more it implodes at its foundation. The more this world aims for unification, the more it fragments. When did it shift imperceptibly on its axis? Was it the world coup that followed the attacks of September 11th? The financial crisis of 2008? The failure of the Copenhagen summit on climate change in 2009? What is sure is that that summit marked a point of irreversibility in this shift. The cause of the atmosphere and the planet offered civilization the ideal pretext for its completion. In the name of the species and its salvation, in the name of the planetary totality, in the name of terrestrial unity, one was going to be able to govern every behavior of each one of the Earth's inhabitants and every one of the entities that it accommodates on its surface. The presiding authorities were within an inch of proclaiming the universal and ecological Imperium Mundi. This was in the interest of all. The majority of the human and natural milieus, customs, and forms of life, the telluric character of every existence, all that would have to yield before the necessity of uniting the human species, which one was finally going to manage from who knows what directorate. This was the logical outcome of the process of unification that has always animated the great adventure of humanity, since a little band of sapiens escaped from the Rift Valley. Up till then, one hoped that the responsible parties would come to a sensible agreement, that the responsible parties in a word would be responsible. And surprise! What actually happened at Copenhagen is that nothing happened. And that is why the whole world has forgotten it. No emperor, even of the collegial sort. No decision by the spokespersons of the species. Since then, with the help of the economic crisis, the drive toward unification has reversed into a global everyone for themselves. Seeing that there will be no common salvation, everyone will have to achieve their salvation on their own, on whatever scale or abandon every idea of salvation. And attempt to lose oneself in technologies, profits, parties, drugs, and heartbreakers, with anxiety pegged to one's soul. The dismantling of all political unity is inducing an evident panic in our contemporaries. The omnipresence of the question of national identity in the public debate attests to this. La France, a world-class exemplar of the modern state, is having an especially hard time accepting its consignment to the junkyard. It's obviously because feeling French has never made so little sense that what we have in the way of ambitious politicians are reduced to embroidering endlessly on the national identity. And since, despite those glorious 1500 years of history which they keep harping on, no one seems to have a clear idea what being French might mean. They fall back on the basics. The wine and the great men, the sidewalk terraces and the police, when it's not quite simply the ancien regime and the Christian roots, yellowed figures of a national unity for ninth grade manuals. All that is left of unity is nostalgia, but it speaks more and more loudly. Candidates present themselves as wanting to restore the national greatness, to make America great again, or set France back in order. At the same time, when one is wistful for French Algeria, is there anything one can't be nostalgic about? Everywhere, they promise, therefore, to reconstruct the national unity by force. But the more they divide by going on about the feeling of belonging, the more the certainty spreads of not being part of the whole they have in mind. To mobilize panic in order to restore order is to miss what panic contains that is essentially dispersive. The process of general fragmentation is so unstoppable that all the brutality that will be used in order to recompose the lost unity will only end up accelerating it, deepening it, and making it more irreversible. When there's no longer a shared experience apart from that of coming together again in front of the screens, 
one can very well create brief moments of national communion after attacks by deploying a maudlin, false, and hollow sentimentality. One can decree all sorts of wars against terrorism. One can promise to take back control of all the zones of unlawfulness. But all this will remain a BFM TV newsflash at the back of a kebab house and with the sound turned off. This kind of nonsense is like medications. For them to stay effective, it's always necessary to increase the dose until the final neurasthenia sets in. Those who don't mind the prospect of finishing their existence in a cramped and super-militarized citadel, be it as great as the France, while all around the waters are rising, carrying the bodies of the unlucky, may very well declare those who displease them to be traitors to the nation. In their barkings, one only hears their powerlessness. In the long run, extermination is not a solution. We mustn't be disheartened by the state of degradation of the debate in the public sphere. If they vociferate so loudly, it's because no one is listening anymore. What is really occurring, under the surface, is that everything is pluralizing, everything is localizing, everything is revealing itself to be situated, everything is fleeing. It's not only that the people are lacking, that they are playing the role of absent subscribers, that they don't give any news, that they are lying to the pollsters, is that they have already packed up and left in many unsuspected directions. They're not simply abstentionist, hanging back, not to be found. They are in flight, even if their flight is inner or immobile. They are already elsewhere. And it won't be the great bush beaters of the extreme left, the Third Republic type of socialist senators taking themselves for Castro, a la Mélenchon, who will bring people back to the fold. What is called populism is not just the blatant symptom of the people's disappearance. It's a desperate attempt to hold on to what's left of it that's distressed and disoriented. As soon as a real political situation presents itself, like the conflict of the spring of 2016, what manifests itself in a diffuse way is all the shared intelligence, sensitivity, and determination which the public hubbub sought to cover up. The event, constituted by the appearance, in the conflict of the cortege de tete, has shown this rather clearly. Given that the social body is taking on water from all sides, including the old union framework, it was obvious to every demonstrator who was still alive that the feet-dragging marches were a form of pacification through protest. Thus, from demonstration to demonstration, one saw at the head of the procession all those who aimed to desert the social cadaver to avoid contracting its little death. It started with the high school students. Then, all sorts of young and not-so-young demonstrators, militants, and unorganized elements swelled the ranks. To top it off, during the 14th of June demonstration, entire Union sections, including the longshoremen of Le Havre, joined an out-of-control head contingent of 10,000 persons. It would be a mistake to see the taking over of the head of these demonstrations as a kind of historical revenge by anarchists, autonomists, or the other usual suspects at the end of demonstrations, who traditionally find themselves at the tail of marches engaging in ritual skirmishes. What happened there, as if naturally, was that a certain number of deserters created a political space in which to make something out of their heterogeneity, a space that was insufficiently organized, certainly, but rejoinable, and for the duration of a spring, truly existing. The cortege de tête came to be a kind of receptacle of the general fragmentation. As if by losing all its power of aggregation, this society, liberated from all quarters, Little autonomous colonels, territorially, sectorially, or politically situated. And for once, these colonels found a way to group together. If the cortege de tete succeeded finally in magnetizing a significant part of those combating the world of the Loi Travel, this is not because all those people had suddenly become autonomous. The heterogeneous character of its components argues against that. It's because, in the situation, it had the benefit of a presence a vitality, and a truthfulness that were lacking in the rest. 
The cortege de tete was so clearly not a subject detachable from the rest of the demonstration, but rather a gesture, that the police never managed to isolate it as they regularly tried to do. To put an end to the scandal of its existence, to re-establish the traditional image of the Union March, with the bosses of the different labor confederations at its head, to neutralize this cortege, systematically composed of young hooded ones who defy the police, of older ones who support them or free workers who break through the lines of riot police. It was necessary, finally, to kettle the whole demonstration. So at the end of June, there was the humiliating scene around the basin of the arsenal, which was surrounded by a formidable police presence. A nice demoralization maneuver arranged jointly by the labor unions and the government. That day, L'Humanity would run a front-page story on the remarkable victory the demonstration represented. It's a tradition among Stalinists to cover their retreats with litanies of triumph. The long French spring of 2016 established this evident fact. The riot, the blockade, and the occupation form the basic political grammar of the epoch. Kettling does not simply constitute a technique of psychological warfare which the French order belatedly imported from England. Kettling is a dialectical image of current political power. It's the figure of a despised, reviled power that no longer does anything but keep the population in its nets. It's the figure of a power that no longer promises anything and has no other activity than locking all the exits. A power that no one supports anymore in a positive way that everyone tries to flee as best they can, and that has no other perspective than to keep in its confining bosom all that is on the verge of escaping it. The figure of kettling is dialectical in that what it is designed to confine, it also brings together. It is a site where meetups take place between those who are trying to desert. Novel chants, full of irony, are invented there. A shared experience develops within its enclosure. The police apparatus is not equipped to contain the vertical escape that occurs in the form of tags that will soon embellish every wall, every bus shelter, every business, and that give evidence that the mind remains free even when the bodies are held captive. Victory through chaos. In ashes, all becomes possible. France, its wine, its revolutions. Homage to the families of the broken windows. Kiss, kiss, bank, bank. I think, therefore I break. Since 1968, the walls had not seen such a spirit of freedom. From here, from this country where it's hard for us to breathe an air that is more and more rarefied, where each day we feel more like foreigners, there could only come this fatigue that eroded us with emptiness, with imposture. For lack of anything better, we paid each other in words, the adventure was literary, the commitment was platonic. As for tomorrow's revolution, a possible revolution, who among us still believed in it? This is how Pierre Puchemar, in Plus Vivante que Jamais, describes the atmosphere that May 1968 swept away. One of the most remarkable aspects of the fragmentation that's underway is that it affects the very thing that was thought to ensure the maintenance of social unity, the law. With the exceptional anti-terrorist legislation, the gutting of the labor laws, the increasing specialization of jurisdictions and courts of prosecution, the law no longer exists. Take criminal law. On the pretext of anti-terrorism and fighting organized criminality, what has taken shape from year to year is the constitution of two distinct laws, a law for citizens and a penal law of the enemy. It was a German jurist, appreciated by the South American dictatorships in their time, who theorized it. His name is Gunther Jacobs. Concerning the riffraff, the radical opponents, the thugs, the terrorists, the anarchists, in short, all those who don't have enough respect for the democratic order and force and pose a danger to the normative structure of society, Gunther Jacobs notes that more and more, a special treatment is reserved for them that is in derogation of normal criminal law, to the point of no longer respecting their constitutional rights. 
Is it not logical, in a sense, to treat as enemies those who behave as enemies of society? Aren't they in the business of excluding themselves from the law? And so for them, shouldn't one recognize the existence of a penal law of the enemy that consists precisely in the complete absence of any law? For example, this is what is openly practiced in the Philippines by its president, Duterte, who measures the effectiveness of his government in its war against drugs by the number of corpses of dealers delivered to the morgue, which were produced by death squads or ordinary citizens. At the time of our writing, the count exceeds 7,000 deaths. That we're still talking about a form of law is attested by the questions of the associations of jurists who wonder if in this instance one might be leaving the rule of law. The penal law of the enemy is the end of criminal law. So it's not exactly a trifle. The trick here is to make people believe that it is applied to a previously defined criminal population when it's rather the opposite that occurs. A person is declared an enemy after the fact, after being phone-tapped, arrested, locked up, molested, ransomed, tortured, and finally killed. A bit like when the cops press charges for contempt and obstruction against those they've just beaten up a little too conspicuously. As paradoxical as this assertion may appear, we are living in the time of abolition of the law. The metastatic proliferation of laws is just one aspect of this abolition. If every law had not become insignificant in the Rococo edifice of contemporary law, would it be necessary to produce so many of them? Would it be necessary to react to every other minor news event by enacting a new piece of legislation? The object of the major bills of the past few years in France pretty much boils down to the abolition of laws that were in force, and a gradual dismantling of all juridical safeguards. So much so that law, which was meant to protect persons and things faced with the vagaries of the world, has instead become something that adds to their insecurity. A distinctive trait of the major contemporary laws is that they place this or that institution or power above the laws. The Intelligence Act eliminated every recourse for dealing with the intelligence services. The Loi Macron, which was not able to establish business secrecy, is only called a law by virtue of a strange newspeak. It consisted rather in undoing a whole set of guarantees enjoyed by employees, relating to Sunday work, layoffs or firings, and the regulated professions. The Loi Travail itself was only a continuation of this movement that had started so well. What is the famous inversion of the hierarchy of norms, but precisely the replacement of any general legal framework by the state of exception of each corporation? If it was so natural for a social democratic government inspired by the extreme right to declare a state of exception after the attacks of November 2015, this was because the state of exception already reigned in the form of the law. Accepting to see the world's fragmentation, even in the law, is not an easy thing. In France, we've inherited nearly a millennium of a rule of justice. The good king, St. Louis, who meted out justice under the oak tree, etc. At bottom, the blackmail that keeps renewing the conditions of our submission is this. Either the state, rights, the law, the police, the justice system, or civil war, vengeance, anarchy, and celebration. This conviction, this justicialism, this statism, permeates the whole set of politically acceptable and audible sensibilities across the board from the extreme left to the extreme right. Indeed, it's in line with this fixed axis that the conversion of a large portion of the workers' vote into a vote for the National Front occurred without any major existential crisis for those concerned. This is also what explains all the indignant reactions to the cascades of affairs 
that now go to make up the daily routine of contemporary political life. We propose a different perception of things, a different way to apprehend them. Those who make the laws evidently don't respect them. Those who want to instill the work ethic in us do fictitious jobs. It's common knowledge that the drug squad is the biggest hash dealer in France. And whenever, by an extraordinary chance, a magistrate is bugged, one doesn't wait long to discover the awful negotiations that are hidden behind the noble pronouncement of a judgment, an appeal, or a dismissal. To call for justice in the face of this world is to ask a monster to babysit your children. Anyone who knows the underside of power immediately ceases to respect it. Deep down, the masters have always been anarchists. It's just that they can't stand for anyone else to be that. And the bosses have always had a bandit's heart. It's this honorable way of seeing things that has always inspired lucid workers to practice pilfering, moonlighting, or even sabotage. One really has to be named Mikia to believe that the proletariat has ever sincerely been moralistic and legalistic. It's in their lives, among their own people, that the proletarians manifest their ethics, not in relation to society. The relationship with society and its hypocrisy can only be one of warfare, whether open or not. It's also this line of reasoning that inspired the most determined fraction of the demonstrators in the conflict of the spring of 2016. Because one of the most remarkable features of that conflict is the fact that it took place in the middle of a state of emergency— it's not by chance that the organized forces in Paris who contributed to the formation of the Cortège de Tête are also those who defied the state of emergency at the Place de la République during COP21. There are two ways of taking the state of emergency. One can denounce it verbally and plead for a return to a rule of law, which, so far as we can recall, had always seemed to come at a heavy price in the time before its suspension. But one can also say, ah, you do as you please. You consider yourselves above the laws that you claim to draw your authority from. Well, us too imagine that. There are those who protest against a phantom, the state of emergency, and those who duly note it and deploy their own state of exception and consequence. There, where an old left-wing reflex made us shudder before democracy's fictitious state of exception, the conflict of the spring of 2016 preferred to counterpose, in the street, its real state of exception, its own presence to the world, the singular form of its freedom. The same goes for the world's fragmentation. One can deplore it and try to swim back up the river of time, but one can also begin from there and see how to proceed. It would be simple to contrast a nostalgic, reactionary, conservative, right-wing affect and a left-wing, chaos-inflected, multiculturalist postmodernism. Being on the left or on the right is to choose among one of the countless ways afforded to humans to be imbeciles. And in fact, from one end of the political spectrum to the other, the supporters of unity are evenly distributed. There are those nostalgic for national greatness everywhere, on the right and on the left, from Sorrel to Ruffin. We tend to forget it, but over a century ago, a candidate presented himself to serve as a universal form of life. The worker. If he was able to lay a claim to that, it was only after the great number of amputations he required of himself, in terms of sensibility, attachments, taste, or affectivity and this gave him a strange appearance. So much so that on seeing him, the jury fled, and since then he wanders about without knowing where to go or what to do, painfully encumbering the world with his obsolete glory. In the time of his splendor, he had all manner of groupies, nationalists or Bolsheviks, even national Bolsheviks. In our day, we're observing an explosion of the human figure. 
humanity as a subject no longer has a face. On the fringes of an organized impoverishment of subjectivities, we are witness to the tenacious persistence and the emergence of singular forms of life, which are tracing their path. It is this scandal that they wanted to crush, for example, with the jungle of Calais. This resurgence of forms of life in our epoch also results from the fragmentation of the failed universality of the worker. It realizes the mourning period for the worker as a figure, a Mexican wake, moreover, that has nothing sad about it. To think that, during the conflict of the spring of 2016, we saw something unthinkable a few years ago, the fragmentation of the General Confederation of Labor, CGT, itself. While the Marseille CGT used its tonfas against the young people, the Duayomatier CGT, allied with the uncontrolled ones, came to blows with the Lyle CGT security crew, which is more hopelessly Stalinist. The CGT in Angique called for sabotage of the fiber optic cables in Hotle used by the banks and telephone operators. During the whole conflict, what happened in Le Havre bore little resemblance to what was happening elsewhere. The dates of demonstration, the positions of the local CGT, the caution imposed on the police, all this was in a sense autonomous from the national scene as a whole. The CGT in Le Havre passed this motion and called the police forces and the prefect to advise them of it. Every time a student is summoned to police headquarters, it's not complicated. The port will shut down. Le Havre had a happy fragmentation. The frictions between the cortege des têtes and the Union security personnel led to a remarkable improvement. The strictly defensive position of many of the CGT security services from then on. They would cease to play a police role in the demonstrations, no longer beating on the autonomous and handing the crazies over to the cops, but would focus instead solely on their section of the procession. An appreciable, perhaps long-lasting shift, who knows. Despite the communique condemning acts of violence, a must after the demonstration against the National Front at Nantes on February 25, 2017, the CGT-44 had organized for that occasion together with Zadis and other uncontrollables. It's one of the fortunate effects of the spring 2016 conflict, and one that will definitely worry some people on the side of the government as well as inside the unions. As something endured, the process of fragmentation of the world can drive people into misery, isolation, schizophrenia. It can be experienced as a senseless loss in the lives of human beings. We are invaded by nostalgia, then. Belonging is all that remains for those who no longer have anything. At the cost of accepting fragmentation as a starting point, it can also give rise to an intensification and pluralization of the bonds that constitute us. Then fragmentation doesn't signify separation, but a shimmering of the world. From the right distance, it's rather the process of integration in society that's revealed to have been a slow attrition of being, a continuous separation, a slippage toward more and more vulnerability, and a vulnerability that's increasingly covered up. The Zad of Notre Dame de Land illustrates what the process of fragmentation of the territory can signify. For a territorial state as ancient as the French state, that a portion of ground is torn away from the national continuum and brought into succession on a lasting basis, amply proves that the continuum no longer exists as it did in the past. Such a thing would have been unimaginable under de Gaulle, Clemencu, or Napoleon. Back then, they would have sent the infantry to settle the matter. Now, a police operation is called Caesar, and it beats a retreat in the face of a woodland guerrilla response. The fact that on the outskirts of the zone, buses of the National Front could be assaulted on a freeway in the style of a stagecoach attack, more or less like a police car posted to a Banlieu intersection to surveil a camera that was surveilling dealers, got itself torched by a Molotov cocktail, indicates that things have indeed become a little like the far west in this country. The process of fragmentation of the national territory at Notre Dame des Landes, far from constituting a detachment from the world, has only multiplied the most unexpected circulations, some far-ranging 
and others occurring close to home. To the point that one tells oneself the best proof that extraterrestrials don't exist is that they haven't gotten in touch with the Zod. In its turn, the resting away of that piece of land results in its own internal fragmentation, its fractalization. The multiplication of worlds within it and hence of the territories that coexist and are superimposed there. New collective realities, new constructions, new encounters, new thoughts, new customs, new arrivals in every sense, with the confrontations arising necessary from the rubbing together of worlds and ways of being, and consequently a considerable intensification of life, a deepening of perceptions, a proliferation of friendships, enmities, experiences, horizons, contacts, distances, and a great strategic finesse. With the endless fragmentation of the world, there is a vertiginous increase in the qualitative enrichment of life, and a profusion of forms, for someone who thinks about the promise of communism it contains. In the fragmentation, there is something that points toward what we call communism. It's the return to earth, the end of any bringing into equivalence, the restitution of all singularities to themselves, the defeat of subsumption, of abstraction, the fact that moments, places, things, beings, and animals all acquire a proper name, their proper name. Every creation is born of a splitting off from the whole. As embryology shows, each individual is the possibility of a new species as soon as it appropriates the conditions that immediately surround it. If the earth is so rich in natural environments, this is due to its complete absence of uniformity. Realizing the promise of communism contained in the world's fragmentation demands a gesture, a gesture to be performed over and over again, a gesture that is life itself, that of creating pathways between the fragments, of placing them in contact, of organizing their encounter, of opening up the roads that lead from one friendly piece of the world to another without passing through hostile territory that of establishing the good art of distances between worlds. It's true that the world's fragmentation disorients and unsettles all the inherited certainties, that it defies all of our political and existential categories, that it removes the ground underlying the revolutionary tradition itself. It challenges us. We recall what Toskels explained to Francis Paine concerning the Spanish Civil War. In that conflict, some were militia. Toskels was a psychiatrist. He observed that the mental patients tended to be few in number because the war, by breaking the grip of the social life, was more therapeutic to the psychotics than the asylum. Civil war has a connection with the non-homogeneity of the self. Every one of us is made up of juxtaposed pieces with paradoxical unions and disunions inside us. The personality doesn't consist of a block. If it did, it would be a statue. One has to acknowledge this paradoxical thing. War doesn't produce new mental patients. On the contrary, there are fewer neuroses during war than in civil life, and there are even psychoses that heal. Here is the paradox, then. Being constrained to unity undoes us. The lie of social life makes us psychotic, and embracing fragmentation is what allows us to regain a serene presence to the world. There is a certain mental position where this fact ceases to be perceived in a contradictory way. That is where we place ourselves. Against the possibility of communism, against any possibility of happiness, there stands a hydra with two heads. On the public stage, each one of them makes a show of being the sworn enemy of the other. On one side, there is the program for a fascistic restoration of unity, and on the other, there is the global power of the merchants of infrastructure. Google as much as Vinci, Amazon as much as Viola. Those who believe that it's one or the other will have them both. Because the great builders of infrastructure have the means for which the fascists only have the folkloric discourse. For the former, the crisis of the old unities is primarily the opportunity for a new unification. 
in the contemporary chaos and the crumbling of institutions, in the death of politics, there is a perfectly profitable market for the infrastructural powers and for the giants of the internet. A totally fragmented world remains completely manageable cybernetically. A shattered world is even the precondition for the omnipotence of those who manage its channels of communication. The program of these powers is to deploy behind the cracked facades of the old hegemonies a new, purely operational form of unity, which doesn't get bogged down in the ponderous production of an always shaky feeling of belonging, but operates directly on the real, reconfiguring it. A form of unity without limits and without pretensions, which aims to build absolute order under absolute fragmentation. An order that has no intention of fabricating a new phantasmal belonging, but is content to furnish, through its networks, its servers, its highways, a materiality that is imposed on everyone without any questions being asked. No other unity than the standardization of interfaces, cities, landscapes. No other continuity than that of information. The hypothesis of Silicon Valley and the great merchants of infrastructure is that there is no more need to tire oneself out by staging a unity of facade. The unity it intends to construct will be integral with the world, incorporated in its networks, poured into its concrete. Obviously, we don't feel like we belong to a Google humanity, but that's fine with Google, so long as all our data belong to it. Basically, provided we accept being reduced to the sad ranks of users, we all belong to the cloud, which does not need to proclaim it. To phrase it differently, fragmentation alone does not protect us from an attempt to reunify the world by the rulers of tomorrow. Fragmentation is even the prerequisite and the ideal texture for such an initiative. From their point of view, the symbolic fragmentation of the world opens up the space for its concrete unification. Segregation is not contradictory to the ultimate networking. On the contrary, it gives it its raison d'etre. The necessary condition for the reign of the GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, is that beings, places, fragments of the world remain without any real contact. Where the GAFA claim to be linking up the entire world, what they're actually doing is working toward the real isolation of everybody. By immobilizing bodies, by keeping everyone cloistered in their signifying bubble, the power play of cybernetic power is to give everyone the impression that they have access to the whole world when they are actually more and more separated, that they have more and more friends when they are more and more autistic. The serial crowd of public transportation was always a lonely crowd, but people didn't transport their personal bubble along with them as they have done since smartphones appeared. A bubble that immunizes against any contact, in addition to constituting a perfect snitch, this separation, engineered by cybernetics, pushes in a non-accidental way in the direction of making each fragment into a little paranoid entity, towards a drifting of the existential continents where the estrangement that already reigns between individuals and this society collectivizes ferociously into a thousand delirious little aggregates. In the face of all that, the thing to do, it would seem, is to leave home, take to the road, go meet up with others, work towards forming connections, whether conflictual, prudent, or joyful, between the different parts of the world. Organizing ourselves has never been anything else than loving each other. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.